five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hello, Gillian. Great to see you. Lovely to have you with us. I'm going to leave you the stage straight away. We're impatient to hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do I have? Yes, okay. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about creating life-changing experiences through interactive, immersive storytelling. How many people here, just put up your hand, if you're involved in any way in storytelling or immersion or interactivity? Nice, okay, great. So to start with, what I mean by life-changing is an event in your life where there is a before and an after. So you know yourself as you were before, and then something changes and you are different afterwards. It can be all of you, parts of you, one aspect of your life. So it involves some form of transformation. That's what I want to underline to start with, is we're talking about creating immersive, interactive events through storytelling that create for people some form of transformation. So how did I get curious about all of this? I think Louise mentioned I worked for many years with Cirque du Soleil. And after eight years, I was given a mandate to be the creative director of the Media Lab, which meant that the company was going to take or was going to make an attempt to take the IP, the essence, the style, the magic of Cirque du Soleil, and transform it in the media space which included VR, AR, mixed reality, included all of the interactive media as well. So I was given this task, I was given this position, and to be honest, not that many people thought that it was really possible, because they felt that the most impactful part of the Cirque shows was that it was live. You're in front of people, you see the trapezist, the trapezer, trapeze artist. <laughs> I've been here for three days and now my brain is working in French. The trapeze artist accomplish a jump, and if you're watching that in media, maybe they did it 10 times, maybe it's you know, some sort of special effect. So people were concerned that it wouldn't work, that people wouldn't be engaged. So it is my job to figure out how to do that. I was a dancer and I was in theater for many years before, so I was already extremely curious about Cirque du Soleil. I was noticing and discerning what the company was doing differently than traditional theater. And I was trying to understand what was working so well so that we could continue to reproduce it. So I spoke to marketing often and said, what are the kind of letters that you're receiving from the audience? I went to a lot of shows. I was touring and casting and I would sit in the audience and talk to people. And the most, what you would call the highest level of brand love was people who wrote letters that said, I went to see a Cirque du Soleil show and it changed my life. People said things like, I remember it the way I remember my wedding day or my 30th birthday party. So really huge impact. This is what you would call the ambassadors. Um, and I spent a lot of time sometimes interviewing people, trying to find out what had happened in the structure of what we were doing from a storytelling point of view that allowed that to happen to people. So, this is the most important thing to start with if you want to create experiences for people that are going to be life-changing on some level. And I'm sure there's people in the room here today who are involved in what we're now calling brand experiences that are also some degree live, immersive, interactive. This kind of experience is becoming extremely important it's unprecedented in the opportunities it's providing for engagement and communication. So unexpected, unique, and rare. It's sort of obvious, but the reason is, from a scientific 
point of view almost is that neurologically, if you talk to a neuroscientist, everyone in this room, we receive anywhere from 300 to 2,000 small pieces of information per second. Our brains are sensorial receptors of information. So I'm talking to you all now. I can hear my own voice. There's a fan behind me. I can feel my feet on the stage. I can feel this in my hand. And then there's many other pieces of information that aren't going through my cognitive brain and consciousness. So when I'm talking to you, I'm not feeling my feet all the time, except now, because I'm talking about it. But we receive that kind of information all the time, and we filter it. So some people who are highly sensitive don't have filters that are working very well. So they can be overstimulated easily. But generally, our filters work from three levels, from when we're a baby. The first one is survival or safety. So even though I'm really interested in talking to you guys, I'm going to notice where the end of the stage is, because my body doesn't want me to fall off and hurt myself. The second one is preference. So if I prefer blueberries or bananas, I'm going to see blueberries first in the buffet at breakfast. And the third one is preference. So if I see my husband in a picture, or if I'm in a crowd at a party, I will notice him first, because he's not dangerous for me, because I prefer him, and because there's meaning, which is the third filter. So I have a lot of shared, meaningful experiences with my husband. So we're always doing that. We're filtering information, survival, preference, meaning. It's a default. Sometimes it's called unconscious bias. So if you want to capture somebody's attention, which is the first step to a life-changing experience, there has to be something unexpected. Oh, what's that? You know, if somebody threw a banana on stage, you would have my attention, including my sensorial brain would be like, oh, that's new information. And unique, we all like something unique, and rare, because when we don't see something often, we notice it. So this is very important for our brains to break through the default pattern of our attention. Oh, where am I? Here's an example of one, just to give you a visual, for those of you who are visual. This is obviously unexpected, perhaps the degree of the northern lights. It's unique. Not that many people are in front of a waterfall in Iceland with northern lights. And it's rare, both being in Iceland for most people and the northern lights. And here's probably the most important thing I learned at Sift Soleil. Life-changing experiences are a fully embodied event for people. So the people I spoke to who said that a Cirque show had, see, that just got louder. I noticed that unexpected event. That had had a show being life-changing for them, they would say that they remembered everything about the show, not just the content on stage. So for instance, if you'd seen a film and something in the film changed your life, Maybe it taught you something about love, it taught you something about a career opportunity, and you say, that film changed my life. But you probably don't remember what you were wearing that day, what time of day it was necessarily, who was sitting next to you if they weren't someone you knew. So it's a memory, it's an intellectual memory of something happening that changed your life. But what people were talking about at Cirque was an embodied memory. So for most people, when they say, I do, at their wedding, they remember everything about it on a sensorial level, not just that it happened. So that's what we're aiming for. So we want these events to be unexpected in a good way, not scary, unexpected, unique, rare, and fully embodied for the person receiving the experience. So that's what I'm gonna talk about the most, is the embodied piece. Because that's really what I learned at Cirque du Soleil that you can't, or I hadn't been able to learn anywhere else. So content, anyone who's here that's a storyteller knows that the content has to be engaging, it has to be moving. Your story needs to have an arc that works well in its storytelling style. Usually there has to be some kind of payoff. So the content piece is much more niche to whatever audience you're engaging with. But the context, the environment in which you're delivering these experiences, the rules are pretty much universal. So here's eight guidelines to make sure that your context gives you the most possibilities of creating life-changing experiences. And if nothing else, 
very meaningful and embodied memories for people. Not if nothing else, but it can change their life or at best, it becomes what I call a chapter in the book of their life. So not just a memory, but they say, if I'm gonna tell my life in 25 chapters, I'm gonna put that experience in that book. So the first one is, create a world. So if you've seen a Cirque du Soleil show, they're magical worlds, they're worlds that don't look like our world, but there's a lot of work put into the preparation of layers and layers and layers that you don't necessarily see on stage to make sure that this world feels intact. So each character has a backstory. People are continuously checking every layer that you can see with your eyes. So when you come to the show, your idea is that this world existed before I came and it will exist after. So you are being invited. This world, this magical forest, has been there all along, and then you arrive at 8 o'clock, and they invite you, and they say, we are waiting for you. We're going to give you a show tonight. But it keeps going afterwards. So whatever you create needs to have as much detail and depth as our own world. So whatever detail you're involved in, whether it's what's on the floor, whether it's smells, whether it's air, costumes, makeup, sound, pay attention to each detail and make sure that it's integrated and it feels like a world of its own. Otherwise, people are gonna think about their own life, their groceries, where they park their car. You wanna create as many layers to the world and as many details, again, that are worked together. Layer the senses. So what people do with interactive immersive is they create lots of stimuli for the senses, but they don't necessarily line them up. The first time I saw a Cirque show was 1994, Alegria. And there was this called a fast track. I'm going to Ah, see, I was paying attention to my body. Now I, now I can keep the microphone. So the fast track is a trampoline that goes across the stage. It's very, very strong. And the artists do these flips. And they build momentum, first two flips. And then the last one, they float in the air. And they do this with their body. So it looks like they're flying. And when you watch that, when I was watching it, I went, oh my God, that looks like it feels so good. And in that moment, the music had one of those kind of spiritual elevating sequences that sounded exactly like what it looked like it feel, felt like to do that. So in that case, the music sounded like what it looked like the artist was feeling. So you have sound, sight, and body sensation all lining up. So there's something called synesthesia, that you also want to include, which is overlapping the senses. Speak to the whole body. So there's something called kinesthetic recognition. If I jump, whether you know it or not, your body has a little recognition of what I'm doing, and that will help communicate whatever emotion or story is being expressed through the body. Which brings me to nonverbal communication. Make sure that you're speaking to your audience in lots of ways that aren't words. First of all, that will help you reach a global audience. You're not stuck in the comprehension of language. And also, we understand body-to-body -body emotional language more quickly and more truthfully than words. Proprioception. That's the ability to see things around us and then remember that they're there. So in a Cirque show, when you have an artist come in from behind and people are surprised, it opens up their proprioception, which opens up your whole brain receptors so that what you experience after that lands more fully in your memory. Focus. Most people can't keep an intense focus for very long or for a long time. They also can't keep a kind of chill, relaxed focus. So you want your information through the storytelling to have moments of intense focus, like an artist on a tight wire, followed by something relaxed, like clowns, and we're laughing, and then back to intense. And that focus allows people, when it's intense, they're connecting to themselves, and when it's relaxed, they're connecting to their environment, and that flow creates ownership for them of the experience. Second to last one, play. There's a lot we can learn about play still, there's a man named Stuart Brown who's written a beautiful, amazing book about it. Play continues into adulthood. 
It becomes creativity, mastery, innovation, all of that is the same part of our brain. And when we're playing, we're having a good time. It's really the, one of the best experiences of life. So we're gonna remember it more. Like how we don't always remember difficult experiences, our psyche is protecting us, we also remember more really positive experiences and play is one of the top ones. If you're learning something new, say after a stroke when they're working with a patient, it can take up to 400 times to create a neurological pathway for new information. If you're in a state of play, it goes down to 30 times. So our brains are very engaged when we're in a state of play. And then the last one is what I call the campfire. So in the Cirque du Soleil shows, it's in the round. The audience is all around the action. What that creates is that even though I'm watching the show, and I'm in a state of suspended disbelief, I'm believing what's happening there, that is a kind of crazy cockroach creature, it's not a person wearing a costume. But when I see other people also engaged in the story, it actually supports my engagement. So you guys are all watching me in a proscenium, you're not necessarily noticing each other. But if I were to say something funny, and there was people seated there, and you laughed and saw them laugh at the same time, that creates a more intense engagement for everybody. So anyway, you can create community around the experience. Even if it's digitally, we do that. We create communities who are together watching something in different parts of the world. That creates also a stronger sense of belonging, meaning, and memory. Zero. That was the clock. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gillian. Wonderful.